Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, thank you for joining in Upper GI Symposium. I'm. Can I start? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. And my name is Jason Min from Busan, Korea. I'm a chair of this session with co-chair Professor Sang Woo Jung in Gyeongsan University Hospital. This session is Symposium Seven, Upper GI Three which is the palliative management for unresectable malignant gastric outlet obstruction, the strength and weakness. We would like to explain the session progression. After each speaker's video stream, we will have a Q&A time with the speakers. If you have any question about the presentation, please click chat on the right side of the screen and write down your question. If your questions are chosen, you can earn the Congress points. In Q&A time, the first three speakers will attend. However, sadly to say, the last fourth speaker cannot attend in Q&A time. For this session, unresectable malignant gastric outlet obstruction, firstly, we prepare the lectures about the oncologic outcomes and then the various type of the methods for palliative treatment will be presented. At first, I'd like to introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Professor Dong Gu from Sungyungwan University School of Medicine in Korea. He will give a lecture on oncologic outcomes of treatment for malignant gastric outlet obstructions. Let's see the first, first speaker's presentation. I'm Dong Ku, medical oncologist. It is my honor to be an invited speaker in this KSELS 2021. I will talk about the oncologic outcomes of a patient with malignant gastric outlet obstruction. I have no personal or financial interest to declare. Firstly, I will show a case of malignant gastric outlet obstruction and I will leave the general prognosis of patients with gastric outlet obstruction from several studies. Also, I will talk about the characteristics of malignant bowel obstruction associated with peritoneal seeding and compare it with gastric outlet obstruction. Furthermore, I will review the systemic treatment for malignant bowel obstruction. This patient was 63 years old female with locally advanced pancreatic head cancer. She had received Folpidinox chemotherapy, followed concurrent chemo radiation until post diagnosis one year and three months. However, her disease progressed and invaded gastric antrum. Therefore, we changed the chemotherapy as a second-line therapy, but it was not effective and she suffered from gastric outlet obstruction. So, we did pyloric stenting and then she could have an oral intake. However, her tumor was persistently progressing and she passed away at three months after first stenting. Malignant gastric outlet obstruction is a common situation in patients with advanced GI cancers. It is challenging to construct a treatment algorithm because physicians should individualize the approach based on disease prognosis and the patient preference. Primary approaches for gastric outlet obstruction are traditionally bypass surgery, such as gastrojejunostomy or endoscopic enteral stenting. And Recently, endoscopic ultrasound-guided gastroenterostomy was introduced, 
and this will be presented at the next speaker in this session. If gastric outlet obstruction is diagnosed during surgical staging, it is appropriate to perform gastrogenostomy. However, when life expectancy is only a few months or less, endoscopic stenting is preferable to gastrogenostomy. This stenting is less invasive, shorter post-procedural hospital stay, less morbidity, and lower costs. This is a retrospective study comparing laparoscopic gastrogenostomy and duodenal stenting in a single Korean center. A total of 115 patients with unresectable gastric cancer were analyzed, and the authors used the propensity score matching method. Survival outcomes from the procedure date show that laparoscopic gastrogenostomy had a better overall survival, 7.3 months, compared to duodenal stem, 3.8 months. Also, the duration of chemotherapy maintenance was longer in the laparoscopic gastrogenostomy group. However, Pre-procedural chemotherapy had already been given to more patients who received the duodenal stenting. Therefore, we should interpret our survival differences from this procedure in this study carefully. Most duodenal stent patients already had chemotherapy after diagnosis, while most laparoscopic gastrogenostomy patients started chemotherapy just after surgery. This is another retrospective study comparing gastrogenostomy and endoscopic stenting in a single USA center. A total of 310 unresectable gastric cancer patients between 2011 and 2017 were unanalyzed. The authors also used the propensity score matching method. The technical success rates were more than 96%. Survival outcomes from the procedure date showed that gastrogenostomy had a better overall survival, 6.4 months compared to the endoscopic stent, 4 months. Also, the duration of luminal patency was longer in the gastrogenostomy group. However, more patients had poor performance and prior biliary drainage in the endoscopic stent group. Therefore, overall survival difference from the procedure in this study also should be careful to interpret it. Since healthier patients are selected to undergo surgery, in comparison, sicker patients may be passed over by surgeons and referred for endoscopic stenting. This is a prospectively randomized comparing study between gastrogenostomy and endoscopic stenting in a total of 21 centers in the Netherlands between 2006 and 2008. A total of 39 patients were enrolled and the patient characteristics are summarized in this table. The mean age was 66 years old and the male was 50% and 70% of patients had pancreatic cancer. According to gastric outlet obstruction scoring system score, there was no significant difference 
in terms of technical failure or persistent obstruction. However, the gastrogenerum stomy group had a more extended hospital stay and more medical cost per patient. In contrast, the endoscopic stenting group had more re-intervention rate. The overall survival was similar in both groups, about two months. According to the gastric outlet obstruction scoring system score, the timing of improved oral intake was shorter in the endoscopic stenting group. However, the gastrogenostomy group had a longer duration of improved oral intake. Although overall survival outcome was not different, endoscopic stenting resulted in a more rapid oral intake, shorter hospital stay, and lower cost, but Gastrogenerous tummy had a better long-term result. Therefore, the authors suggested that gastrogenerous tummy may be given to patients with a ripe expectancy of two months or longer. This patient was 68 years old male with advanced gastric cancer. He presented peritoneal carcinomatosis with gastric outlet obstruction. So we did a GI stent. And then we did exploratory laparoscopic, but open and closure due to severe carcinomatosis. Even after two weeks from ONC, his tumor aggravated and made him recurrent gastric outlet obstruction. Therefore, we performed the second upper GI stent. Fortunately, he was tolerable to first line for Fox chemotherapy for more than four months, and he is doing well after six months from first upper GI stenting. Recently, we report a retrospective study of a total of 5,384 ages patients who received chemotherapy between 2000 and 2015. We compared the treatment characteristics and survival outcomes about four periods. The median overall survival was improved over time with advancement in chemotherapy, and sequential chemotherapy has established a standard of care more than 50% in second and third line chemotherapy. Particularly, the introduction of anti heart target agent Trasumab with pluripyrimidine and platinum combination, double chemotherapy contribute to the increase in the number of long-term survival and improved overall survivors. Also, triple chemotherapy showed better overall survival outcomes compared to double chemotherapy groups. This patient was a 71 years old male with advanced gastric cancer. He presented peritoneal carcinomatosis with distant lymph node metastasis. After embolization for upper GI bleeding, he had received one first line XP capsitabine as cisplatin chemotherapy and well response to chemotherapy. However, his disease progressed and he suffered from gastric outlet obstruction, so we did easy junction stenting to let him have a oral intake. But he could not take any oral intake 
after five days from endoscopic stenting because there was no bowel movement due to peritoneal carcinomatosis. We carefully checked this condition and then started the second line chemotherapy and then his bowel movement could improve. He is well tolerable and responds to second line chemotherapy after two months since endoscopic stenting. Malignant bowel obstruction is defined by clinical and radiographical evidence of bowel obstruction, usually distal level to the trait ligament, secondary to a primary intraabdominal tumor with peritoneal metastasis. The pathophysiologic malignant bowel obstruction is explained as follows. The peritoneal carcinomatosis makes inflammation of periintestinal space and it triggers digestive secretion and makes to increase the third space of fluids. Then it aggravates hypovolemia and bowel distension. This makes the high frequency of peristalsis and worsen intestinal epithelial damage. Therefore, Periintestinal inflammation and amotility were complicated. This is a double blind randomized study comparing ranleotide 30 mg somatostatin analog or placebo in 80 patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis in operable malignant bowel obstruction from 22 European hospita hospitals between 2003 and 2008. The primary endpoint was the proportion of patients responding on day 7, which means no vomiting after nasogastric tube removal. Concomitant treatments were standardized as follows, IV steroid, day 1 to 5, IV PPI on day 1 to 3, and antispasmodics or antiemetics on day 1 to 3. Results showed that the patient receiving ranleotide had an increased well-being score from day 3 to day 7. Also, the proportion of responder patient as a primary endpoint was significantly higher in the ranleotide group. The authors concluded that more patients receiving ranleotide than placebo were responders and improvement in well-being were more significant with ranleotide from day 3 to day 7. There was an expert recommendation of a medical therapy for malignant bowel obstruction with peritoneal Carcinomatosis. In the first stage, from day 1 to day 3, symptomatic support should be provided, including IV PPI and short course IV steroids with or without nasogastric tube insertion. Next stage, reassessment is needed whether the obstruction is resolved or not, and somatostatin analog can be applied if the obstruction is persistent. This is a reassessment algorithm on day 7. This patient was a 47 years old male with HER2 positive advanced gastric cancer. He presented peritoneal carcinomatosis with multiple lung and liver metastasis during receiving first-line FP chemotherapy with trastuzumab. He complained the abdominal distension. His symptom was compatible with malignant bowel obstruction. 
The nasogastric tube insertion was performed, but it was not effective in relieving his malignant bowel obstruction symptoms. Therefore, we applied malignant bowel obstruction regimen, IV fluid mixed with metoclopramide, dexamethasone, and octreotide. After five days of ambio fluid, his bowel movement improved and he could have a oral intake. This is our MBO regimen protocol. I am emphasizing that the physician should check the patient whether he had a mechanical obstruction or not, because this regimen could aggravate the perforation due to high dose metoclopramide and could mask the patient infection even there was peritonitis due to high dose steroid. This is a summary of my talk. A prospective randomized trial showed that stenting resulted in a more rapid improvement of intake, shorter hospital stays, and lower costs, while gastrogenostomy had better long-term result, but both had a poor overall survival outcome two to three months. Therefore, the appropriate decision between stenting and gastrogenostomy is a challenging issue. The recent advance of systemic chemotherapy could improve the overall survival of patients with GI cancers. Therefore, systemic treatment should be combined for managing in malignant gastric outlet obstruction patients. Lastly, somatostatin analog regimen could be applied to patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis in operable malignant bowel obstruction. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gu. Thank you for your presentation. And from now on, we would like to start q a time for the first presentation with Professor Dong Gu. But we don't have any question in the chat on the screen. But uh, let me ask you two questions. Um, Professor Gu, some patients with gastric outlet obstruction are unable to eat after failing failure of the procedure palliative procedures and how about you do you perform chemotherapy for the patients who cannot eat or just perform the conservative treatment instead of the chemotherapy yeah thank you very much for your good question and that's a very uh, depends on the case by case but uh, principally the i prepare to build up the patient condition and then try to give a chemotherapy. So uh, if you ask the question case, the patient already failed to intervention of gastrointestinal obstruction, uh, actually I will try to build up the patient condition and try to the resolve the gastrointestinal obstruction or parenteral nutrition support and then discuss with the patient or caregiver to whether give chemo or not. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gu. And uh, the second question, whenever the gastric outlet obstruction palliative treatment, for example, palliative gastric or jejunostomy is consulted to the surgeons, most of the surgeons have curious about the duration of life expectancy. And do you use do you use any special tool to measure the duration of life expectancy in your institution? Uh, <laughs> actually, that's impossible, as you know, our colleagues also. Uh, we cannot expect the patient for some, we have uh, some prostate motor or prostate huh, factor formula, but that's uh, just uh, we expect the trend of a patient you know, and group but not case by case. So just a multidisciplinary approach to, to patient. So surgeon and I 
Also, endoscopists agree to palliative surgery because the patients are tolerable and good performance and expect their long-term survival. We try to move the operation room, but patient condition is not good. We prefer the endoscopic stamping. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your answer. And uh, yeah, thank you. There's no another questions for, for Dr. Gu. And let's move to the second presentation. Thank you, Dr. Gu. Okay. Uh, I would like to introduce the second speaker. Uh, he's a Professor Dong Hong Kim from University of Ulsan College of Medicine in Korea. And he will give a lecture on endoscopic stent insertion. Let's see the second speaker's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'd like to talk about endoscopic stent insertion. This is my COI disclosure. Surgical bypass traditionally has been a main treatment for malignant gastric outlet obstruction and has been useful and feasible. Recently, the placement of self-expandable metallic stents has been developed as an alternative to surgical bypass. The first surgical treatment was performed in 1881 by Ludwig Lidinger for a patient with a duodenal ulcer. In 1884, he introduced new method of surgical peptic ulcer treatment using gastroenterostomy. The first radiologic stent placement case published in the literature was reported by Professor Song who implanted a coated metallic prosthesis in a patient with obstructing cancer of the gastric antrum by a surgical gastrostomy. After that, the feasibility of inserting self-expandable stents in malignant duodenal obstruction was demonstrated by radiologists using fluoroscopic guidance in a per or a percutaneous route. However, at that time, the percutaneous route is quite invasive and the polar delivery of a stent in the duodenum under exclusive fluoroscopic guidance fail in more than 10% of cases. Palliative endoscopic stent placement with fluoroscopic guidance was first reported in the 1992 by Dr. Kozarek. Since then, Several authors have published interesting results from endoscopic duodenal stenting. Improvement in biomedical manufacture have allowed the use of stents placed through the operating channel of therapeutic endoscope. Recently, fluoroscopic or endoscopic placement has been increasingly used as a safe non-surgical palliative treatment option for malignant gastroduodenal obstructions. This procedure carries higher clinical success rates, lower mobility and mortality rates, and it has been shown to be an effective modality associated with a shorter hospital stay, decreased costs, and faster symptom relief compared with surgical gastrogenostomy. Traditionally, two approaches are utilized for stent placement, over the wire under fluoroscopic guidance or through the scope method under endoscopic guidance. The former technique is most often performed by interventional radiologists, whereas the latter is almost exclusively performed by gastroenterologists. Fluoroscopic placement allows easy manipulation of the guide wire use of the longer delivery system and visualization of the horizon. In particular, in cases of tortuous strictures, fluoroscopic negotiation of a guide wire through the stricture has been preferred over endoscopic placement. Next, let me take a look at how to endoscopic stand insertion. For the TTS placement technique, the endoscope is initially placed near the stenosis. 
A guide wire is introduced through the stenosis, along which the delivery system is then advanced. After that, a delivery system is advanced along the guide wire. Finally, the stent is deployed with adjustment of position. The guide wire delivery system and endoscope are then removed. Endoscopic stent placement should be loaded in 10 French stent introducer for through the scope delivery system because 10 French in diameter stent introducer will fit into a 3.7 mm diameter working channel of endoscope. Endoscopic placement provides greater accessibility to stricture site and can reduce radiation loads. However, Endoscopic procedure is not always feasible due to tight or torpus strictures and insufficient visualization because of food materials. Traditionally, negotiating a guide wire and a stent delivery system through an obstruction under fluoroscopic guidance alone has frequently failed because of guide wire buckling or the stent delivery system forming a loop in the distended stomach and gastroduodenal tract. Endoscopy may overcome these limitations by supporting and facilitating advancement of the guide wire and stent delivery system through the working channel of the endoscope. Now, I'm going to talk about clinical effectiveness of self-expandable metal stent. A total of 135 publications, stent insertion was attempted in 606 patients with malignant symptomatic gastrobudinal obstruction. Stent placement used included endoscopic placement 39%, fluoroscopy with endoscopic guidance 34%, and fluoroscopy only 27%. Technical success was achieved in 97%, clinical success in 89%. Resolution of symptoms occurred within a relatively short period of time, meaning 4 days. Mean survival period of 12 weeks indicated that survival in the pooled population corresponds to the life expectancy range recommended for stent implantation in palliative treatment. If patients survive for longer periods, they may encounter stent-related problems such as stent obstruction due to tumor ingrowth or overgrowth. There are no procedure-related mortality and a very low rate of severe complication Non-severe complications occurred in 27% of cases. These published evidence from case series suggest that gastroduodenal stenting offers good palliation and is a safe and effective treatment option in patients with a short remaining lifespan. There was a randomized controlled study. Figure shows a main result of study. Gastric outlet obstruction symptom improvement was not different between two modalities, although food intake improved more rapidly after stent placement than after gastrogesnostomy, less than 24 hours versus 2 to 4 weeks. Adverse events were not different between two modalities. Recurrent obstructive symptoms occurs more frequently after stent placement than after gastrogesnostomy. Quality of life was also no different between two modalities. The costs were higher for gastrogesnostomy than for stent placement. In conclusion, based on treatment effect, it is recommended that stent should be used in patients with a shorter predictive survival, 4 to 6 weeks. Surgical gastrogesnostomy seems preferable in patients with a longer predictive survival, more than 4 to 6 weeks.
Meta analysis between endoscopic stenting versus gastrogenostomy. The results of the randomized and non randomized controlled trial demonstrated that endoscopic stenting resulted in a shorter time to tolerating an oral intake, lesser complication, lower mortality, and a shorter hospital stay. This endoscopic approach is also in line with the minimally invasive goals of palliation, namely minimizing pain, hospitalization, and physiologic stress to the patient. Major complications were reported in 12 studies. There were no significant differences in the rates of major complications between patients undergoing endoscopic stenting versus gastrogenostomy. However, patients undergoing gastrogenostomy suffered more major medical complications, such as respiratory tract infection, myocardial infarction, and acute renal failure. In patients undergoing endoscopic stent, the majority of the complications were procedure-related including stent fracture, migration, and obstruction. This study suggests improved outcomes for endoscopic stenting over gastrogenostomy, and therefore, palliative patients with malignant gastric outlet obstruction may be better palliated with endoscopic stenting when compared with gastrogenostomy. Gastrogenostomy is preferable to endoscopic stent placement for the palliation of gastric outlet obstruction caused by unresectable or metastatic gastric cancer in patients with a good performance status, especially ECOC 0 to 1, in terms of a lower risk of adverse events, longer patency, and extended survival. This is a review article from Korea Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. Conventional bypass surgery and stent placement are both effective and relatively safe methods in patients with malignant gastric outlet obstruction. However, stent placement should be considered in patients who are expected to have a short survival time because of stent placement is superior to conventional bypass surgery in terms of short procedure time, non-invasive, and rapid clinical symptom improvement and high cost effectiveness. In other review articles showed, fluoroscopic or endoscopic stent placement has become the mainstay of treatment for malignant gastric outlet obstruction. Because it is minimally invasive, safe, and cost-effective. Compared with surgery, stent placement can result in more rapid resumption of food intake, fewer complications, and shorter hospital stay. Gastrogenostomy may be more suitable for patients with receptive disease and longer life expectancies, but it is still being debated. Let me talk about gastric outlet obstruction in the future. What is the future of treatment of gastric outlet obstruction? Can the immediate effect of stent placement be combined the long-term efficacy of gastrogenostomy? Is the newly developed EUS-guided gastrogenostomy technique the solution? EUS gastrogenostomy is performed using lumen opposing metal stents. Let's take a look at how to EUS gastrogenostomy insertion. This is a video showing a procedure uh, of a uh, EUS guided gastroenterostomy. So you see here uh, an image view of a of an small bowel loop seen from the stomach. And as you can see, the uh, endoscopist uh, Frank Flecher from the UMC Utrecht is puncturing here uh, the, the, the loop. And then uh, using this loop or over this guide by, or over this needle, uh, a lumen opposing metal stent is placed, uh, as can be seen over here. So the, the stent is nicely placed. And then uh, the, the, the jejunum loop is adhered to the uh, gastric wall. And then also on the other side, 
the lumen opposing metal stand is being deployed. And so this looks a very elegant uh, solution. Uh, and of course, uh, it, it is not so easy as it looks. Uh, but here you see that the procedure was quite successful because uh, the methylene blue that was injected in the jejunum uh, comes out of the uh, lumen opposing metal stand. So this was a success. It seems to, this seemed to be a successful placement, and here you see the final result. In comparison between EUS gastrogesinostomy versus surgical gastrogesinostomy, the clinical outcomes of the two groups are summarized in table. Although the clinical success rate was significantly higher in the surgical gastrogesinostomy group as compared to the EUS gastrogesinostomy group, the clinical success rate was similar between both groups. The rate of gastric outlet obstruction recurrence was not different between the two groups. The rate of adverse events was lower in the EUS gastrogesinostomy group, but the difference was not statistically significant. The mean length of hospital stay was also similar in the EUS gastrogesinostomy group compared to the surgical gastrogesinostomy. In conclusion, EUS gastrogesinostomy is associated with equivalent efficacy and safety as compared to surgical gastrogesinostomy. EUS gastrogesinostomy is a non-inferior but less invasive alternative to surgery. Same was also true for study of EUS gastrogesinostomy versus endoscopic stent placement. Technical and clinical success rate between the two modalities were not significantly different. The rate of gastric outlet obstruction symptom recurrence and reintervention following initial clinical success was significantly lower in the EUS gastrogesinostomy group. The overall rates of adverse events were not significantly different between the two groups. Post-procedure length of stay was comparable between the two groups. In conclusion, EUS gastrogesinostomy may be ideal for malignant gastric outlet obstruction with comparable effectiveness and safety to endoscopic stenting while being associated with fewer symptom recurrence and requirements for reintervention. Summary and conclusion Fluoroscopic or endoscopic stent placement has become the mainstay of treatment for malignant gastric outlet obstruction because it is minimally invasive, safe, and cost-effective. Compared with surgery, stent placement can result in more rapid resumption of food intake, fewer complications, and shorter hospital stay. Gastrogesinostomy may be more suitable for patients with resectable disease and longer life expectancies, but this is still being debated. In the future, EUS-guided gastrogesinostomy can be the solution with the immediate effect of stent placement combined the long-term efficacy of gastrogesinostomy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation, Professor Yim. Yeah. From now on, we'd like to start the Q&A time for the second presentation with Professor Dong Hun Kim. And yeah. there's one question uh, in the floor. And the question is for uh, from the Professor Sang Woo Jung, who is a co-chair in this session. And the question is, could you explain the size indication of gastric outlet obstruction? Do you mean the 
tumor size, Professor no. Sang Woo Jung? Uh, the indication of the uh, stenting. Yes, I understand uh, Professor Jung. And usual indication is when the endoscope cannot be passed. Uh, the outer diameter of the typical endoscope is about one centimeter. So uh, when endoscopy, when the patient is dysphagia or vomiting, in, uh, we perform endoscopy and then the endoscope is could not, could not pass the, through the obstruction site. We, uh, in, in that case, is very useful indication of gastric outlet of obstruction. However, sometimes in advanced gastric cancer, it is possible to possible to pass through the endoscope. However, there are cases with gastric outlet obstruction symptom. In in the stent is less effective in that case because this is often a problem with gastrointestinal motility disorder a problem, not an obstruction problem. So uh, in Bowman type four cancer and the infiltrating cancer is diffused in the gastric antrum and body. However, uh, uh, spared the uh, uh, pylorus. In that case, is, is due to the gastric motility, uh, the patient is to vomiting and dysphagia. In, in that, that patient could uh, not, we, we usually recommend the stenting. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh, one more question. Is uh, the, uh, is either criteria of uh, stenting is impossible. Do you mm -hmm. have a uh, indication? Uh, tumor size indication. You no, and you is... you side cast out obstruction in this junior structure is a uh, size is a very uh, uh or two or three three meter. You can transfer to a surgical uh, genostomy. Or... Yes, in. And usually in a uh, patient performance status is good. And we recommended uh, endoscopic with fluoroscopic guidance or uh, co-procedure with radiologist. However, uh, uh, sometimes uh, patient uh, performance status is good and uh, life, lifespan is long life expect expectancy. Uh, we transfer to the gastrogenostomy in surgical gastrogenic nostomy. Uh, no, no size criteria in stenting. Yeah, okay. In, uh, usually endoscopist is uh, uh, it, stricture size and tumor length is usually not problem to in, in stent insertion. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Professor Kim, how about the cases of gastric outlet, which is a completely obstructed and yeah. is there any way to perform the stent insertion? And that's in com uh, nearly completely or completely cases is we, uh, I prefer to, ref uh, I refer to the uh, radiologist and only exclusive radiology stent. Uh, and sometimes uh, radiologists can stenting, stent insertion. Yeah. And let me ask you some questions. Um, I wonder the probability of reinserting of the stent after uh, gastric outlet obstruction recurring yeah. after the first insertion. Yeah. How about the incidence of the reinserting of the stent? Uh, I, I do not know exactly the instance of re-stenting. However, uh, ever. I, I think and uh, about uh, if patient is alive, in 10, 10 or 20% of cases is reinsertion. However, uh, as you know, the endoscopic stent patient is not longer life expectancy. So yeah. uh, a patient is die before re-stenting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me ask a last question. And uh, I want the difference of the method of the stent insertion uh, between the duodenal obstruction due to the pancreatic cancer Okay. and uh, parallelly obstruction because yeah. of the gastric cancer. Yeah. Is there any different method for stent insertion? And the tumor infiltration is extending to, into the duodenal second portion, and we are cautious about uh, biliary drainage. So sometimes we uh, refer to the pancreatic biliary department and biliary stent is first, and then in duodenal stent insertion. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's no the other answers. And thank you, Professor Kim. And thank let's you. move to the third presentation. And from the third presentation, the co chair, Professor Sang Woo Jung, will present. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Min. I'm Sang Woo Jung from Gyeongsang National University, Asia. So let's move to uh, first speaker. Uh, next speaker is uh, Moon Kashyap uh, from the Johns Hopkins Hospital in the United States. Uh, he is a, a great, graduated medical school at American University of Beirut and uh, is an intern and fellowship in, in Indiana University and fellowship at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, he is an associate professor and uh, director of a therapeutic endoscope in division of gastroenterology and hepatology at Johns Hopkins. He's a very busy researcher and uh, he published more than 375 papers in peer-reviewed journals. And he's associate editor and journal endoscope. Uh, uh, he speak about EUS guided gastrojejunostomy. Please. Hello, everyone. My name is Zemon Kashab. I'm the director of therapeutic endoscopy at Johns Hopkins Hospital. It's pleasure. It's my pleasure to join you today to speak on EUS guided gastrojejunostomy for the management of gastric outlet obstruction. Why do we need a new treatment modality for the management of gastric outlet obstruction? There are shortcomings of the currently available treatment modalities. Surgical gastrojejunostomy is effective, but it's a surgical procedure and it's invasive and it's significantly morbid in these patients with advanced cancers. There is associated infections and delayed gastric empty, emptying, increased cost and delay in cancer treatment because patients need to recover from a surgical procedure. Duodenal stenting is widely available, relatively easy to do, but recurrent gastric outlet, outlet obstruction due to stent occlusion is pretty common. This is a significant problem in 2020 when we are seeing increased survival in patients with periampillary cancers with improvement in chemotherapy and radiation therapy management uh, regimens. The potential benefits of EUS guided gastrojejunostomy, it combines advantages of an, of an endoscopic procedure, namely endoscopic stenting and also surgical gastrojejunostomy. It offers a long-standing luminal patency without the risk of tumor ingrowth overgrowth, similar to the surgical gastrojejunostomy, since the, since the anastomosis is being created away from the tumor site. It avoids the morbidity of a surgical procedure in these mid-terminally ill patients, as it is an endoscopic uh, procedure. So, Let's move and talk about techniques of EOS guided gastrojejunostomy. And I'll start with the direct technique or freehand technique, which is the technique I've been performing now for several years. This is an example of how it's performed, and I'll be showing you more examples for this technique to be uh, more uh, understood by everybody. This is a scope in the small bowel and we inject contrast, methylene blue and saline. We change the scope to an EOS scope from the stomach. We target a dilated small bowel loop. We aspirate fluid. When we see blue dye, we know this is the jejunum. This is to avoid an inadvertent gastrocolostomy. When we remove the FNA needle and direct puncture without a wire, with a hot axis here, 
so it's an electrocardiogram tip, lumen opposing metal stent. We use either 15 or 20 millimeter stent, and then we create a gastrogenostomy. After it's placed, we see blue dye, and that uh, proves that we are we have a successful gastrogenostomy. The technique that's performed in Japan by Takao Itoi, it's called the balloon occluded gastrogenostomy. This is a double balloon that he invented with that where he advances the balloon to the small bowel, inflates both balloon with a large volume of fluid uh, to occlude part of the jejunum, and then inject fluid between the two balloons, and that creates a stable target for an EOS-guided gastrogenostomy. This balloon is not available outside Japan. This is the old technique that we started doing uh, in the past, when, before we had the cautery enhanced lumen opposing stents. It, it's continued to be done today. People feel they need to have a target in the jejunum to make sure an appropriate anastomosis is formed. So this is a wire that's being advanced uh, with a EGD scope across the obstruction to the jejunum. This is a balloon catheter a dilating balloon catheter being advanced to the jejunum. We inflate the balloon so we know it's in jejunum, and then the balloon is targeted with an FNA needle. Once it, once it pops, we know that we're in the jejunum. This is followed by advancement of the wire through the needle into the jejunum, and then followed by placement of a lumen opposing metal stand. Um, you know, the reason for the balloon is to ensure we have a target in the jejunum to ensure we're avoiding puncturing the uh, colon. With the technique that I previously mentioned to you with uh, adding methylene blue and then the finder needle to ensure we're in, in the jejunum, I think it simplifies the procedure and avoids uh, the need for uh, balloon assistance. Um, some experts are still using the balloon technique, but um, as I mentioned to you, I've been consistently using the freehand uh, technique. Uh, this is some data now. This is the first US experience published by myself and Todd Barron back in 2015. Uh, here we had the first 10 patients. Technical success was seen in all patients except uh, one with the metastatic breast cancer, and clinical success was achieved in all patients who had a successful uh, procedure and even in the first 10 patients we had no adverse events. This is uh, a paper published in GUT by Takao Itoi. His first 20 patients used the double balloon technique and success 90 percent and uh, two patients had stent misdeployment. This is something that can happen with this procedure. Most of these are salvageable here, what happened with the cow is that he was trying to advance a wire to the jejunum with a needle and then advance the stent over the wire. What happens in that case is the wire pushes the jejunum away. That's why we use the freehand technique. We learned from these mistakes uh, by all of us. So now we avoid use of a wire and we use the freehand technique, who, which is actually safer than going over the wire. This is a study we published few few years ago comparing uh, EUS gastrogenostomy to duodenal stenting. 30 EUS GJs, 52 duodenal stents. And see here technical success, clinical success equivalent between uh, both groups, but look at the recurrent gastric outlet symptoms. 4%, 26%. And of course, this is due to tumor and growth usually in the duodenal stenting arm, as you can see here. This is the etiology of recurrent symptoms, the renal stent arm here, mostly due to tissue ingrowth, some food impaction in the EU, US gastrogenostomy. Uh, what we do now, we instruct patients to go on a low fiber, low residue diet, uh, and this ensures no food impaction within their stents. We actually hand them pamphlets to educate them on what a low residue is. This is uh, another study comparing US uh, EUS GJ to surgical GJ, 
everything is equivalent. You can see clinical success, technical success. I mean, the technical success was a little higher in the surgical arm, but everything else was pretty equivalent between uh, both, uh, both arms. Another study uh, from uh, another group comparing US GJ versus laparoscopic GJ. Um, again, clinical success, pretty equivalent. There were a lot of stent dislodgement in this study. Uh, this is very, very high um, in a third of patients. This is just to tell you this can happen. There is a learning curve to this procedure. We do have a paper coming up in GIE about the learning curve and how many procedures do you need to master the technique. There is a steep learning curve. Um, and even when, once you get, you get to, to your, uh, once you pass your learning curve, this procedure can be very fast, very effective and safe. And rarely stent dislodgements can happen, but these can be, uh, can be uh, managed endoscopically uh, for the most part. Uh, this is uh, this is the stent, stent dislodgement happened during um, our initial experience with GJ. Uh, we placed the stent correctly, but then during balloon dilation, it dislodged, so we don't balloon dilate anymore. So what we did in this case, we left the axis in place. You don't have to do that. You can remove the axis and go through the gastrogenostomy. Um, and here we identified the enterotomy site and uh, passed a wire. So here we're using actually a sphincter term. This is the enterotomy and the small bowel. After we pass the wire, we pass the lumen opposing metal stent over the wire. So here initially uh, we remove the first uh, lumen opposing stent over the wire to ensure we have continued access. But as I mentioned, uh, you can remove the axis initially uh, to simplify the procedure. Here, the lumen opposing stent was advanced over the wire into the small bowel. The first flange was opened, and then the small bowel was dragged to the stomach, and the second flange was deployed. Uh, this, this usually uh, solves the problem. Mind you that this is a rare event where you have an enterotomy in the small bowel. Here, the stent was correctly placed, and then it got dislodged. That's why you have an enterotomy, a hole in the small bowel. Most dislodgement is where one uh, flange is deployed in the peritoneum and one flange is deployed in the stomach. There is no enterotomy here. So all what you need to do is remove the axial stent and close that small gastrotomy uh, with maybe an over the scope clip or, or, use, or a small clip or uh, through the scope clips. Uh, I typically use an over the scope clip because the stomach muscle is thick. Usually these gastronomies are small and easy to close. Um, what technique is best? I already mentioned I use the direct or freehand technique comparing balloon assisted to a freehand technique. Uh, this is a multi-center study published in GIE. Um, so Technical success pretty high in both, clinical success very high in both, but look at the procedure time. You save a lot of time with the freehand technique since you don't have to advance the balloon or anything like that. Uh, so this is what I advise. Uh, what about benign gastric outlet obstruction? This is a controversial uh, indication. We rarely use it. We have used it, but it's not common. This is These are in patients with a specific uh, etiologies for benign gastric outlet obstruction. This is a study we published on various etiologies. Uh, I'll show you some examples. This is a patient with a duodenal hematoma, spontaneous duodenal hematoma. So it's impossible to treat these patients with any other methods. This is a stomach that's very dilated. And here we see the duodenal hematoma. You can't put a PEG-J, you can put a duodenal stent because they are unremove, not removable. So here we are just uh, proximal to the obstruction, so the EGD scope, proximal to the obstruction in the bulb, and we're injecting dye through the scope. So dye and methylene blue and saline to opacify the small bowel. We typically give glucagon to paralyze the small bowel. It's very important and it works better than biscopan. We don't have biscopan in the US, but when I've used it internationally, it doesn't work as well. So glucagon works better. 
And all we do, we inject using 60 cc syringe syringes under with force, and we put about 400 cc's and opacifier a small bowel. We remove the EGD scope, put an EOS scope, aspirate blue dye, then freehand technique with a lumen opposing stent. I deploy the first flange, pull back the jejunum to the stomach, and then deploy the second flange, and you see blue dye confirming correct placement. This is an example of a patient with benign gastric outlet, another benign gastric outlet obstruction. This is a uncovered stent previously placed by an outside endoscopist uh, for the thought that the structure was malignant. Uh, and the stent was not removable. This is another indication for a uh, GJ. Uh, what we do in these patients, we perform an EGD every six to 12 months to make sure the stent is not getting embedded, there's not much tissue overgrowth, et cetera. And if we see beginning of overgrowth, we just have to uh, change the stent. Uh, this is a patient with surgical anatomy, a Whipple uh, procedure and benign gastric outlet obstruction due to a kink in the uh, efferent loop. Here we are opacifying the uh, small bowel uh, using an upper scope, gastrojejunal anastomosis, efferent limb, and the obstruction is here. And here we push the EOS scope, and here we pushed it to the efferent, uh, proximal efferent limb and performed a jejunal uh, jejunostomy. Find the needle here. We use the small needle to aspirate blue dye, followed by a lumen opposing stent, pull the jejunum to the proximal jejunum, and to basically bypass that obstruction. This is a jejunum, jejunum, jejunostomy for benign efferent limb obstruction. In conclusion, AUS gastrojejunostomy remains a very promising but technically challenging procedure. Adverse events still occur even in experts' hands, some of which are severe. Endoscopists should have expertise in interventional EUS. Technical challenges can be overcome with several endoscopic techniques and experience. EUS GJ is likely superior to duodenal stenting in terms of stent patency. Prospective randomized trials are needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Dr. Mohan Kashyap. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he is uh, difficult to uh, talk, so uh, we cannot discuss. However, we have an uh, excellent endoscopist. Oh. Uh, uh, Dr. Kim will uh, uh, talk about this uh, topic. Uh, please, Dr. Kim. Yes. Uh... Uh, although the procedure is not performed in Korea, uh, however, the stand distant is uh, lumen opposing metallic stand used for uh, is used in pancreatic biliary procedure. So I think it will be used for gastrointestinal procedure in the near future. Uh, in four patients, especially the terminal patient, in endoscopic procedure. Is very uh, is very useful to the patient than surgical gastrointestinal. <clears throat> okay, thank you for your comment. And uh, the time is a little bit uh, delayed, so we need to uh, finish this session. Thank you for your okay. announcement. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we are very grateful to all of you for your participation. And thank you very much for all of you. And the next session will start right away in this channel. Thank you very much. Thank you.